Hi, welcome to CMO Insights, the podcast series. I'm your host, Jeff Pedowitz, President and CEO of the Pedowitz Group. Today is our guest. I have a good friend, a colleague, and a legend in his own right, John Miller, Chief Marketing Officer of Demandbase. John, welcome to the program. Yeah, thanks. It's been a long time since we talked, and it's really good to catch up. It really has. Well, thank goodness we have this program, right? It gives us a vehicle to, to catch yeah. up. We haven't been able to go to any trade shows, no conferences. So uh, you've had an amazing journey, I think, just starting off in your career, founding Marketo, um, really establishing the early aspects of demand gen, and now between Engageo and demand base, which is pioneering ABX. Um, you know, someone that's been doing this for a long time, what, um, where do you think the market is now, just in term, and where do you think it's going in terms of disciplines and things that today's best marketers should be thinking about? <clears throat> well, you know, I mean, very timely right now, here we are nearing at the end of 2020, you know, I do think, you know, a lot of marketers are facing, you know, economic headwinds, you know, whether they're looking at kind of flat budgets year over year, or God forbid budgets being cut year over year while growth targets, <laughs> but, but still having to do, you know, more growth. So right now, I, <clears throat> I really do think we are in a world where the theme for marketing should be, you know, how to do more with less. Um, at the same time, I mean, when I see my marketing team, I see other marketing teams, they're working as hard as ever, you know, even if they're working from home, right, they're working hard. And so I don't think the answer to doing more with less is just telling everybody to work harder, right? So obviously, what do you have to do? In that case, you have to work smarter. You know, and the, the good news is I think there are a lot of interesting opportunities out there for, for people to work smarter. And in many ways, that's what I think really the whole idea of ABX at its core is, is all about. You know, like traditional demand generation is very broad, kind of let's try to touch everybody or just, you know, see, and kind of see what happens. And, you know, more than anything else, you know, account based experience ABX is about how do you kind of get a little bit more focused you know on the right accounts the right opportunities the ones that are really hot and in market put more of your attention on those you know um and get more results a simple kind of metric that i not everybody measures not, not a lot of people measure and i find is worthwhile is what percentage of your leads or your meetings or even your opportunities are coming from your target account list, you know, and those are the accounts that you've said are going to be the best ones, that are the most profitable, the most valuable, the easiest to sell, et cetera. You know, just by shifting more of your focus onto just getting more meeting, percent of meetings from those target accounts, you're probably going to be working more efficiently than you would otherwise. You know? And why do you think uh, Level all sales and yeah, why do you think sales and marketing organizations struggle with the discipline in, in terms of the focus? Is it the, the pressure of just hitting the short term number? So just to get a deal to get a deal or is it really a lack of adoption in, in the enterprise to really make sure that you're using the systems and tools? Maybe it's a little bit of both. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of factors, but probably the biggest thing I see is I think most companies still think of an account based strategy as like something that they add on or something that they do they're either doing account based or they're not doing account based and i think a much better way to think about it is that your go to market's a spectrum and you're going to have some accounts that are really high potential really valuable and they're going to get a lot of attention and resource and you'll have some accounts that are quite good and pretty good fits and they should get a pretty fair amount of attention down to just accounts that kind of, Hey, maybe we could sell to this company if they were interested, if they happen to be interested in raising their hands. And, you know, so you just like you're, you have the spectrum of deal sizes and values. You can have a, a spectrum of, of go to markets or, you know, a, a spectrum of focus, if you will. And it all fits under one go to market. You know, so put, to put simply, if it's something that you're trying to add on to everything else you're doing, 
it's going to seem really hard. Right. And if it's just a lens you apply to the things that you are doing, you know, to work smarter, it's suddenly not not so difficult. But why why do you think marketing faces so much headwinds with trying to bring in ABX uh, and with sales? Probably because sales doesn't really understand it and marketing isn't pitching it the right way. You know, one of the mistakes I see, there's a couple of key mistakes I see companies make. You know, the first is marketing picking the target accounts. You know, you get a tool like demand base. We have all this amazing predictive analytics and we can tell you these are the best accounts. <laughs> like these are the hot ones. And marketing's like, great, let's go do that. Hey, sales, here's some target accounts. Almost by definition, sales isn't bought in there. You know, um, Second, you know, another another factor that kind of gets comes into play is how departments are measured. You know, there's too many companies today that are still measuring marketing based on marketing sourced or marketing influenced pipeline. But that whole concept of like marketing originating the deal, that might have made sense back in the days of Marketo when you could quote unquote generate a lead and baton pass it to an SDR and pass sales but you know today the buying is so much more complicated you know whether if you do have that one lead it's just a you know an indication of like one small thing that's happening at the account in a complex buying journey that relay race analogy doesn't work anymore and a much better analogy today is that it's a soccer team we have players in different positions but they pass the ball back and forth and in that mindset you know, you don't track, you know, the fullback scored the goal or the forward scored the goal. You track we scored a goal, you know, and you need that same mindset when it comes to pipeline creation. You know, the, the metric should be total pipeline created from any source because the reality is, especially in an ABX world, marketing and sales and the SDR are likely all touching that account at different you know stages in the journey. So, you know, as what you measure, what you get, if you measure marketing source pipeline, you're going to sort of be telling people not to work like a team, right? If you me measure total source pipeline, it's much more easy for everybody to work together as a team. You know, it's interesting. We, we've seen the same thing. And Dr. Debbie and myself came to that same conclusion. And then we admit we made a mistake in the early days of, of demand gen and marketing automation because we advocated for marketing sourced pipeline and bookings and getting a seat at the table yep. and then only to realize that just perpetuated the divide between sales and marketing because it's still set off who is going to get credit versus we should be winning or losing together as a team you know it's one bookings target one pipeline target um, i don't think that means marketing should stop measuring i mean i think inside marketing attribution is important for like where do i move my money and how do i get the best return from the right channel but from an enterprise perspective should have matter, right? Whether or not the team is hitting the bookings. The sports analogy works well here, right? You know, you, yeah. the scoreboard says the total score, right? But that doesn't mean there's not a coach, you know, a, a defensive coach who is like tracking what individual people are doing, not for the purpose of victory, but the purpose of improvement and optimization. Yep. Yes. Sports analogies are always good. Unless, of course, our listeners don't like sports, they, they might have a little trouble following along. Um, you know, demand base has had a lot of success in, in the market. Um, and as one of the pioneers in, in uh, first account based marketing on ABX, of course, what have you seen change over the last five years as this has become more mainstream? We, we do start see a lot more companies adopting ABX, but what have some been some of the biggest changes? Yeah, I think the best way to describe that is to go back to the analogy that I used five, six, seven years ago when I was starting Engage You. You know, and I, and I talked to people as I was leaving Marketo that, you know, marketing with Marketo is like fishing with a net. You know, where you'd run your campaigns, you catch fish, you didn't care which fish you caught, you just cared did I catch enough fish. But ABM, that's all about fishing with a spear. I'm going to go find those big guys and go after them. The analogy was great. It made sense. People nodded their heads. It was very visual. But in the last five, six, seven years, I've sort of come to a conclusion that for lack of a better way of saying it, getting poked by a spear doesn't feel very good. You know, and I suppose it doesn't. <laughs> if you think back to the Marketo days, 
there is a respect for the buyer that was sort of built into the concept of lead nurturing and scoring. Mm-hmm. You know, the whole idea was just because you're a lead doesn't mean I'm going to call you. You right. know, we're going to nurture you until you're actually ready to speak to sales. And that was better for the buyer who didn't get unwanted phone calls. And it was better for the salesperson who didn't have to make calls to people who didn't want to talk to them. But then when we got to the ABM land, all of a sudden we're just like, you're a big fish and I want you, so I'm going to call you. You know, and we sort of lost that respect for that buyer experience um, because it was all about finding the big fish and targeting them. So that's why I introduced ABX instead of ABM. Account-based experience tries to bring the precision and targeting of ABM, but the respect for the buyer experience that kind of like we used to have. And it's all about knowing not just is this an account I'm interested in, but also where are they in their journey? And adjusting your go to market and your messaging and your tactics, you know, to sort of effectively be respectful for where that account is in their journey. So if they're cold to you, you know, and like you you want to sell to them, but they're not somebody who's, you know, who even aware of you, you know, don't go poking them with a spear. Think about how do you build some brand and awareness, you know, and in early engagement at that account. Um, kind of like we did with nurturing, but, you know, in a very intentional way at that focused account. And then the other thing that really unlocks this and enables this was the rise of intent data and predictive analytics supported by that. You know, the, the ability to actually be able to get some signals around when an account might actually be ready to talk to the salesperson because they're entering, you know, a buying cycle as evidenced by the intent data and the predictive analytics. Um, and, and therefore really focus our proactive outreach to those hot accounts that are actually at the point where they want to hear from us. So that's probably been the biggest change, right, is is respecting the buyer's experience, knowing where they are in their journey and adjusting our go to market accordingly. So as, as someone that has has played a big role in MarTech, um, you know, and now, now as a marketer yourself. Do you feel like we've gone too far as an industry with all the technology that we have? Do we still not have enough? Or are we using what we have the right way? It's a, you know, those early years we had like what, 10 or 15 applications or something, and now we have 10,000? Well, you know, there's a couple of core apps, right? I mean, I think when you think about, especially the go to market pipeline generation function, we have our CRM, we have our marketing automation. We have a sales engagement tool usually, you know, kind of, uh, you know, an average or sales loft or something like that. And increasingly, I think we are seeing ABM platforms as kind of an essential part of that stack, uh, you know, that that people are going to have. And and the ABM platforms, interestingly, also increasingly are bringing data, you know, because you also need data to kind of support the whole thing. You know, sure, you'll have your webinars and your websites and there'll be other tools, but I would say that first set is your kind of your core core stack. But what's happening, especially as ABM platforms become more common, is I think marketing automation platforms are becoming less and less strategic, mm-hmm. you know, and more and more becoming, you know, glorified email systems. Yep. Um, and yeah, so it sounds like you're seeing that in your customers too. So my vision that I've had at Engageo and we brought forward to Demandbase is, you know, we think that ultimately the ABM platforms like Demandbase will be able to do things like sending emails and hosting landing pages. And you'll have a single go-to-market platform that can really span both your ABM and your demand gen, i.e. that whole spectrum of styles that I talked about. Um, that's not, you know, six months away, but it's not super far away either. Um, and I'm not saying we'll replace market automation at every single company, but those 80% of companies that are using it for just email, they might have an alternative. No, we agree. We're seeing a lot of the same things that the things that used to be the center, right? So if, if, if phase one was CRM and marketing automation, those were your key tenants and systems. They're still important, but CRM is giving way to CDP. Marketing automation is kind of giving way to multi-channel, different types of applications. And even within marketing automation, it didn't really do orchestration as much as it just did uh, nurturing with emails. It wasn't really set up in wave one, right, to handle multiple channels. 
Um, I, I think we're going to see a lot more of AI um, really driving a lot of the campaign interactions and because with all the different touch points and, and yes, the data is there, but I don't think humans can act fast enough uh, to be able to hit the right people at the right time. And, and so I think it's going to be, I, I see marketing's role moving more towards like a marketing scientist and a program, figuring out all the different behavior paths and then kind of setting it up. And then the system self learns, right. And actualizes and realizes what's happening in the moment and can fire off the email on its own or adjust the language or adjust the offer. Um, similar like, you know, Pega does a little bit of this, right. With next best action. But I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Yeah. We call that, you know, a self-driving go to market platform. You know, I think you sort of said the marketers go more towards the data science. I actually think it might mean the marketers can get more towards the creative side. Mm. If I have a self-driving platform, I get to really focus on the strategy. Where do I want to go? What am I trying to achieve? You know, what constraints am I putting on the system? You know, and the system itself can worry about the details of which lane I'm in and how fast am I going and, you know, avoiding that obstacle. So, you know, it's it's interesting. I think probably you'll see some bifurcation. You'll need some engineers to sort of be managing the system. You know? Fair enough. Yeah, I mean, but I do think it's getting to a point where how many systems can one person manage and be skilled at, uh, especially if they're enterprise class and, yeah. and be able to maintain them and keep them up. Yeah, that's fair. Um, but I think a good analogy is what we're starting to see happen in content, right? Where the AI is getting pretty darn good at generating content. Yep. You know, but you still need a human to prompt it. Right. And so yes. what we're seeing is the best practice that's emerging is not AI created content. It's it's AI assisted content. Right. And and that's probably a good way to think about what will happen for campaigns and you know things like that. There's um Scott Ranger did this with his More Tech 2022 report. He was showing the AI generated art. You know, that's a big thing now. Um I think someone along those lines, someone still has to put in well, what characteristics do you want to see in the art? You know, what are we talking about here? And then the computer takes those inputs and kind of c comes back to you with a rendered um, drawing or a painting or something. Um, so I, I still think, yeah, you have to have that marketer providing the input. They're basically saying, well, this is strategically what I think should happen based upon someone being in this stage of the, of the process. And then the systems can take it to scale. Um, but really, it's fascinating just to see how far the industry has moved in 15 years. But at the same time, the core problems are still the same. You know, like sales and marketing, they're still not aligned. Marketing still struggling to justify its, you know, what its impact on the organization. And companies are still trying to get a better return on their spend, except now there's a lot more technology that's part of the marketing's budget than it was back in the day. Yep. So, which puts even more pressure on a marketing executive to be able to justify what they're doing with the company's resources. Sure. Yep. Yeah. But, but it's not boring, right? I mean, that's why we do. I think if they can consolidate some of the tech stack, you know, maybe they don't need a separate data provider. Maybe they don't ultimately someday need a separate marketing automation solution. That's going to actually, I think, ultimately help the marketing execs, you know, manage the budget, but also just be more effective. So offhand, we happen to know how many components are in your stack at demand base. Uh, we don't track it, but I guess it's easily, you know, 60 or 70. Good right. Number. A couple core things and a whole bunch of like little tiny things. So what's the next evolution for demand base as a platform? Well, I've alluded to it, right? You know, we're, we're you know, we're you are uh, building a go to market, a self driving go to market platform. You know, which ultimately will talk, you know, be self-driving like we've talked about. We think that will blend marketing automation and and traditional ABM today tr to really enable orchestration of the customer experience across these kind of different styles. Uh, one of the big trends is, I think, uh, really understanding buying groups. Um, you know, like like class, you know, in, a, in the platforms today, there's there's people and there's accounts. And that was a pretty big transformation versus Marketo, which just had people. Right. But what you really want is also a third object, which is the buying group uh, that sort of represents a specific group of people who are on a journey to buy a specific solution or product. Um, and I think the more that can become a first class object will really unlock really interesting use cases, especially around kind of cross-sell and upsell. 
um, and expand expansion at, at customers and really understand kind of which do- different buying groups are interested in which products. So you mentioned like heat mapping um, or different type of score or clustering analysis to understand what's happening in each account. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think a little, perhaps even more sophisticated than that. You know, when you if you really have an object, which is a buying group, you know, um, you can start to predict who should be the members of that buying group based on the personas you've seen purchase other. It, the personas that have been part of your other you know, of of the buying groups for the same product in prior uh, opportunities, and then you can start applying your predictive analytics not just to the account but to the buying group, um, and understand which buying groups are where each buying group is in its journey. You know whether they're just aware and they need education, or they're hot and in market, you know, and need outreach, Russian. and that so works. Buy, well. Buying group psychology, huh? Yeah. So, anyways. Yeah. Fascinating. Uh, so I know we have a short time left. One of my favorite questions I like to ask people that come on the program is to reflect. Uh, so you've had so much success as uh, an entrepreneur and as a chief marketing officer at some of the best firms in the world. But if you were going to go back and talk to your younger self uh, when you were just getting started in your career, what would you tell them? Yeah, well, thank you for giving me a sec to think about this one beforehand. Um, I'm 50 now and I've been doing a lot of yoga. Uh, and I've learned, you know, how important flexibility is uh, as I've gotten older, right? In my 30s, I'd go for a run or workout and like straight to the bar, you know, skip the stretching and the flexibility. So, you know, physically, I've learned the importance of flexibility and I would try to encourage my younger self to focus on that. But I think the same concept applies to work as well. You know, there have been times in my career where I perhaps haven't been flexible enough especially when I have a vision of where something should go, you know, if it doesn't quite exactly match out as my vision, how can I be more flexible to kind of adjust and evolve over time? Excellent. Well said. Although now that I'm over 50, I just skip the workout. I go right to the bar because I figured <laughs> I burned it. <laughs> but uh, no, good point. Flexibility. Absolutely. John, so good to catch up, man. Thank you so much for being on the program. Uh, wish you nothing but continued success over at Demandbase. Uh, success to you as well. And let's do a real catch up sometime soon, too. Absolutely. Got it. John Miller, everybody. Thank you.